Uh, he, when, he, when there was a, a detail in a treaty between America and France about whaling and whale oil and how to do, deal with it, this will upset some people I know, but the facts must be faced, um, he decided to write a treatise on whaling all by himself just to determine what the economics of whaling were. Um, as I say, he was a very keen on inoculation. He's, he's a great botanist, and his notes on the state of Virginia count as one of the very first studies of the American ecology and archaeology and, uh, so to speak, bedrock uh, ever written. And he had a great debate with the fantastic French phony, uh, the Comte de Buffon, who was considered then to be the greatest paleontologist of all time and who believed that the atmosphere of the United States could only produce pygmies and cretins um, <laughs> and slaves, um, and that even though the Native Americans were, were racially inferior and so forth. Well, uh, Jefferson in his debate with de Buffon and in his notes on the state of Virginia rallies tremendous scientific knowledge, but there's only so far he can go. Uh, with, if, you, if you want to think of Jefferson in another tragic dimension, you can think like this. Um, Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin were born on exactly the same day. Pure coincidence, with no significance, but somehow interesting. I would say Darwin was a greater emancipator than Lincoln myself. But these people, living at the end of the 18th century, were living well into it, actually. I mean, Jefferson was alive when Darwin was born, had no idea of what was coming. They couldn't see as far as the next horizon. And so what they, a lot of what they write fills them with a sense of pathos. In his argument with de Buffon about the mountains of Virginia and the rock formations, neither of them can work it out. How did the shells get so high up on the mountaintop? How did they get there? They don't know. They don't know that deism is a fallacy, because it's the best they can do. Maybe there's a god who doesn't intervene, but it's the best we, it's as far as we can go. Um, maybe Jefferson speculated on this a lot. Maybe uh, people from Africa are of a different species, and that's why they're so biddable. That's why they take to slavery so easily. He hoped it wasn't true but I think he suspected that it was true. So he's living in the age of pseudoscience. He's living in the age of alchemy rather than chemistry. But as far as he could go with what scientific equipment he did have, whether it was studying balloons for transport, not for war, uh, or vaccination, he, he, he did push it, as far as I can see, as well as a man of the Enlightenment could do. And so we who stand on the shoulders of giants um, should be careful with being too, dare I say, judgmental. Um, about people who were doing the best, uh, but still lived in an age of religious barbarism and ignorance and stupidity, uh, and superstition, yeah. and slavery, and madness, and yeah. all that, <laughs> that people want back now, <laughs> which is now such nostalgia. <laughs> I have a question from the cur Colonel Carlson. Oh. I know because you're unusually fair-minded and well-balanced and never really opinionated. Uh, I'm interested in why on earth you tackled uh, Mother Teresa as, a, as in the missionary position. And Christopher, I'm sure you'll give a crazy to yeah. the audience. Uh, I was asked uh, why someone of my um, natural uh, tenderness and pudeur <laughs> and fair-mindedness would... And by the way, one mustn't confuse fair-mindedness with objectivity. You, you know how people often do that in this culture. People say even, they think even handedness is objectivity or fairness is objectivity or uh, putting both sides. And there's not. Objectivity is the search for truth, even if it leads you to unwelcome conclusions. Uh, it's nothing at all to do with impartiality. But none of these things apply in the case of Mother Teresa because it's a, a simple matter of record that she was a fanatic and a fundamentalist and a fraud. Um, <laughs> I think probably the most, the most successful confidence trickster of the last century, um, and responsible for innumerable deaths, and for un untold suffering and misery, and proud of it. Um, do, should I just assert this, or would you require any proof? <laughs> I just learned well, you know how fair-minded some people could be. I just learned about John Roger and Charles Keating, for example. Oh, well. Thank you, John. There's one way, of, there are three ways, two, two ways of doing it. One is you say, well, if she was so wonderful, how come she went to Haiti at the invitation of the Duvalier family, took money from them, which didn't belong to them, had been stolen from the Haitian poor, said how wonderful the situation was for the poor in Haiti, how the poor loved the Duvaliers and the Duvaliers loved them back. How does she get to Haiti in the first place? She's supposed to be in Calcutta. 
You've got to get all the way to Haiti to praise a regime that is notorious for its ringing of the poor. Oh, she did it because out of solidarity with people who thought like her and because she needed their money, which they'd stolen. As she stole hers from Charles Keating of the Lincoln Savings and Loan, who gave her a million and a half dollars and a private jet in return, pretty good deal actually, for an olive crucifix and a blessing <laughs> when he was on trial. Uh, he needed a character witness. Uh, the, court, the court then wrote to her and said, you've got a million and a half of the dollars we're looking for that belong to the poor of California. Do you feel like giving it back? She never replied. Uh, well, she'd written to the court in the first place. That's just the fraudulence. That's, I, that's just touching on the fraudulence. But by the way, if, if, any, if any of what I've just said is true, and it all is, how come you need me to tell you? How come that my profession hasn't enlightened you about this already? How come this woman stands underneath a Niagara of undiluted free publicity for all these years? Ask yourselves. But that's just the fraud. As for the fanaticism and the fundamentalism, look, she said that poverty was a gift from God. It should be accepted. It should be welcomed. She believed that uh, disease and poverty were necessary for the formation of a good character. And she opposed um, the only thing that uh, is known to cure, <laughs> excuse me, to cure poverty. There is only one known cure for poverty. It's very simple. It doesn't matter whether you go to Bangladesh or Basra or Bolivia. Um, if you can give women control over their rate of reproduction, uh, and come back to that village in 10 years' time, everything will be better, right away. It's the only thing that works. If you can throw in a handful of seeds and a bit of credit as well, and ge generally try and funnel it through the, the mothers and the wives, it will be enormously better right away. But it, nothing else works, and if you don't do it, people die all the time very horribly, and they have appalling diseases like polio that they can spread to other people. Well, Mother Teresa spent her entire life saying that that solution was impermissible. She waged her entire life making sure that didn't happen. So I wish there was a hell to which she could go, because she has a lot of death on her conscience, and a lot of misery, and stupidity, and ignorance, and dirt, and filth, and disease as well. Poison, a poisonous woman patronized by a poisonous pope, whose national security advisor she was, while, she could, while they could both breathe. I don't miss them, and nor should anybody else. Religion, religion is the enemy. How, is how long, how much right. is it going to take to convince us of this? Faith, faith is not a virtue, but if it was, it would be the most overrated of the virtues. <laughs> we have a question right here in front, Christopher. You, you've written about democracy being something that's uh, highly susceptible to being exported. And, uh, you know, we're trying that in Iraq, and I'm not going to hammer on that. I'm just curious if if you have any observations how that should have been done in Iraq. The gentleman asks uh, whether I think, or if I think, or if it's the case that I think that democracy is for export. Would that be a fair pricing? Well, no, I mean, you've, you've stated that. Yes. You're right. uh, to which the answer is yes, I do. And then he asks, what about Iraq in that context? Well, how do you think it should have yeah. been done? Uh, but have I summarized, for the, those who can't hear you. Okay. Would you accept that as a precy of your sure. question? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know of any case where democracy has been implanted except by export, as a matter of fact. With the possible exception of the English Revolution of 1640 and the resulting civil war and the execution of the king and the establishment of parliament, it was reasonably homegrown, um, but had to be defended against interventions from outside, trying to prevent its spreading, which is the cor corollary case from the, from the papacy and um, the royalist powers of Europe, um, and which is a revolution that is germinal for Thomas Paine and for the American Revolution also, and the Scottish Enlightenment, and eventually the French Revolution. Um, were it not for the, for the French, the United States certainly would not have had a democracy. It was only the force of French arms that expelled the British Empire from North America. And that wasn't even a, a democratic country during the intervening. It was uh, King Louis who did that. Um, to the extent that, say, uh, India is a parliamentary democracy. It's not because of indigenous conditions. It has to be, simply has to be conceded. Most Indians would concede it. There had to be a collision between a, an admittedly very civilized and very advanced Indian uh, society and culture, which had never had it, even the, the idea of democracy or the free press or the printing press at all um, between, before this germinal process could begin. <laughs> 